I'm John Paul Himka. I'm a retired professor from the University of Alberta, Professor Emeritus. I've been a specialist in Ukrainian history for the vast majority of my uh, breathing and living days. And I've worked on a number of topics. And now I've got a new book out published by the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies Press. And it's a co-edited book with uh, Franz uh, Sabo. Uh, it's called Eastern Christians in the Habsburg uh, Monarchy. And it's a collected uh, volume where I've, uh, and Franz and I, Franz Sabo, my co-editor, we've uh, contacted various scholars and we've put together a collection on this topic, Eastern Christians in the Habsburg Monarchy. It is the first study of such a thing uh, ever. And, and uh, that's why we wanted to do it. Uh, we felt that there were certain things that were neglected, both in Habsburg history and in the history of Eastern Christians. And uh, we would bring them together and offer this as kind of a, um, a challenge in a good sense. Of, of the existing scholarship. And it's a volume which we've put together from other people's writings be, because uh, it is not something anybody is able to take on entirely by themselves. Uh, perhaps somebody like Professor Magucci could do this, but uh, normal mortals cannot. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have him uh, in, uh, writing a very important uh, uh, contribution to this volume. But the thought is this, the thought is this, when we think about the Habsburg monarchy, and I'll be brief on the Habsburg side of it, but uh, when we think about the Habsburg monarchy, uh, most of the studies of the religious culture of the Habsburg monarchy is the long-standing conflict and debate between Catholicism and Protestantism. But actually only about 60% of the Habsburg monarchy's inhabitants were Roman Catholic. And some kind of toleration was enshrined in law for a very long time. Uh, and uh, after 1526, when the Habsburg monarchy began to fight back against hunger, against the Ottoman Turks and recapture certain lands, and when uh, in 1772, the Habsburgs were involved in the partition of Poland, it acquired actually very substantial populations of Eastern Christians, uh, Serbian Orthodox, uh, Romanian Orthodox, uh, uh, Romanian Catholics uh, eventually were to appear, Greek Catholics, and of course Ukrainian uh, Catholics, uh, Greek Catholics as well, and Ukrainian Orthodox as they expanded. So little attention has been given to these groups in Habsburg history. Um, and I have to say that this is something which doesn't follow the normal pattern that the Habsburg monarchy uh, specialists use. So they normally either look at events from the perspective of the central government in Vienna or Budapest, or they take an individual crown land like uh, Galicia or Bohemia, and they... Uh, uh, concentrate on that uh, 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 territory. And often, really, they carve out of that history of, let's say, Bohemia or uh, Galicia, a national history, Czech history, a Ukrainian history. But, you know, this was shared experience of empire. If you go to Chernivtsi or Lviv, you can see lots and lots of vestiges of the Habsburg monarchy and the role it played in, in those cultures. So we tried to find something, well, we, we found something easily that encompassed a great many different crown lands and gave a dis, diff, different perspective on Habsburg studies. And uh, Franz uh, Sabo is one of the leading figures in Habsburg studies. Well, so we decided we would, we would, we would, we would put together this uh, volume. It started as a conference, but it ended up as a volume. Not everybody who, uh, who who attended the conference was able to submit a uh, uh, contribution to the volume. But let me give a 
Let me say what it is from the Ukrainian point of view first. From the Ukrainian point of view, this is an attempt to really put an emphasis on Ukrainian sacral culture. Very little has been written about this, particularly in English. People who can read Ukrainian and Russian, they, they can get a much better kind of appreciation of these things, although uh, it would be a long story for me to explain uh, how long it's been taking them to get into this topic. A uh, number of years of imposed uh, uh, official atheism under the Soviet Union has certainly done a lot to, uh, to undermine the possibilities of the study of Ukrainian sacred culture. And I'll say that uh, when, when finally in the 1990s the Soviet Union disappeared and communism was uh, reduced to a kind of fringe movement, in Ukraine at least, at that time when people began to study icons, really they had very little understanding of Christianity and its tenets, its folklore, its, uh, I mean folklore, its lore, its, uh, its literature, and the topic was neglected. And even today, and I would say particularly in the diaspora, there is, and in mainstream Ukrainian studies, there's really very little work on the religious culture of uh, the Ukrainian people. And um, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a very big blank spot. We know a lot about, uh, we have a very great interest in Cossacks, we uh, read a lot about the nationalists, you know, but we're an educated diaspora. Most of our, I think most of our people uh, here in Canada and the United States have, have a college or a university education. They can understand more complicated things. And it's part of the attempt at this volume to to, to give people an understanding of a culture which we see all the time, but it's invisible to us. Like we go to church, but we don't understand all the culture behind it. And maybe we don't go to church, which is, I think is the, really the norm uh, among many, many modern uh, uh, Ukrainians. Or we go on Christmas and Easter because as national traditions. But it's very interesting, and I'll go through that as I, as I give you a tour of the book. So it starts out with an introduction by Franz and myself, in which we point out how how we want to uh, revise um, Habsburg uh, monarchy studies, Habsburg studies, and how we want to revise or at least push towards a revision of Eastern Christian studies. And uh, this is because about Eastern Christian studies, until the mass emigration to North America. The Habsburg monarchy was the westernmost outpost of the post-Byzantine Orthodox Greek Catholic culture. And it is exposed to very different forces and pressures than was true elsewhere in Eastern Christendom. It has hybridity, which means that it uh, interacts a lot with Western culture, and it also uh, retains very much its uh, Eastern Christian uh, um, soul or mind, um, uh, spirit, so that it's a different phenomenon. In Eastern Christian studies, the dominant, dominant um, kind of Eastern Christianity that's studied is Russian Orthodoxy. And then when, the, of course, the Byzantine Empire and the Greeks, all of which are state churches. And these state churches had many advantages over uh, some of the more Western uh, Eastern Christians. So let me give you an example. In Galicia, in Ukrainian Galicia, the Orthodox Church survived for many years, for decades, for, for centuries, under a Polish Catholic, uh, in a Polish Catholic state. In that state, they were neglected. Uh, monasteries tended to be made of wood, 
There were no major libraries or scriptoria in our monasteries, unlike in Pskov or, or uh, Moscow or uh, Novgorod or those kind of places, um, because it was neglected by the state. And what we developed was a kind of Eastern Christianity that was very bottoms up, very bottoms up. Uh, it was poor and it was uh, uh, often uneducated, but one thing it was not was culturally sterile. There was a very interesting uh, culture that was produced in difficult and different conditions than the rest of uh, Eastern Christianity. So an example, I, I, I wrote a book some years ago called Last Judgment Iconography in the Carpathians, which is about the Rus, uh, Ukrainian areas, uh, roughly, you know, Roughly Galicia, northern Bukovina, uh, the Lemko region, uh, Transcarpathia, the Prashov region. Uh, there was formed a kind of unity. Very, very, I think a very, very interesting history. It's not, certainly not my best selling book. Uh, but uh, uh, it shows what a vibrant culture there was and how it interacted uh, with the bishops with the people, uh, very often the people were the drivers of the culture, and it produced very unique things. So that's kind of where we want to aim this book was to say, you know, it's more than uh, it's more than it's more than the Russians, really. This is a culture that has a certain complexity of its own conditions of its own, and it's intellectually extremely interesting. So that's kind of where my side of the book. Uh, you know, the idea is this, that in the Habsburg monarchy and its kind of formation, uh, it is a counter-reformation power. That is, it, uh, it, it put down uh, revolts of Protestants in its origins, and it uh, was for a long time the leading Catholic power of Europe. But eventually it made uh, a toleration for the Protestants. And uh, this is particularly the case after 1526. In 1526, the Ottoman Empire took all of Hungary. And that was a huge territory. It's not like the little country we see today. Hungary was a large country. And the Habsburg monarchy, which had possessions like all over Europe, uh, but in its kind of basic German speaking and uh, Czech speaking uh, uh, homeland, it, it inherited the right to the throne in Hungary. But Hungary was actually taken over by the Turks. And from 1526, until 1699, the Habsburgs fought against the Turks to regain all the territory of historical Hungary. And in that process, they acquired a great many Eastern Christians. So they took Slavonia, they took Hungary. Hungary had a fairly large uh, Orthodox population. It had, in Transylvania, uh, Romanian-speaking Orthodox and some Ukrainian-speaking Orthodox there. And in the area of, of northeastern uh, Hungary, that was all inhabited by uh, Ukrainians and Rusyns. So it's that region around Preshov today in, in Slovakia, the region around uh, uh, Transcarpathian Oblast in, uh, in, in Ukraine today. They, they acquired those with, by battle, as I say, from 1526 to 1699. So they ended up with a very large Eastern Christian population. Then in 1772, the Habsburg monarchy was one of the three powers that began partitioning Poland into little bits. And with that, in 1772, Austria acquired Galicia, Halicina. Galicia was partly Roman Catholic, uh, 
the western part was largely inhabited by Poles, uh, and the eastern part was inhabited entirely by uh, Ukrainian uh, 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 Greek Catholics. By that time, by the time of 1772, there were Greek Catholics. And uh, at the same time, two years later, 1774, Austria, the, the Habsburg monarchy takes Bukovina, which brings more Orthodox into the realm. And then, of course, in 1908, they annex Bosnia and Herzegovina, one of the things that starts World War I. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is basically, well, largely... Uh, a mix of Eastern Christians, Western Christians, and Muslim. So, so the the monarchy was extremely diverse, extremely diverse, and among those people were Eastern Christians. I can't give you a percentage at the moment, but you know, I, it's it's probably something like ten, fifteen percent of the populace. I can't really can't really say, um, but they were a presence, and I have to say, they were very well treated in the monarchy. Well, I would say that it, it, the, the, the imbalance in Eastern Christian studies has, has been quite a, quite a bugaboo of mine for many years. And I've I taught in, in, for a number of years as well the history of orthodoxy at uh, the University of Alberta. I also began writing on uh, Ukrainian religious history a long time ago. And so I was very well aware of these problems. Where, where it became acute for me, uh, the research that became acute for me, was when I was working on my book on Last Judgment Iconography. Uh, I would sometimes present papers on Ukrainian uh, icons of the Last Judgment, and I would have people who came out of Russian studies, just dismiss it and saying, these aren't real icons, only the Russians make real icons. And then as I, you know, was working on this, I, I began reading all the classic texts of, Reich, of, of, of Russian uh, iconographic studies, the classic original texts like uh, uh, Florinsky and um, uh, Trubitskoy, and I realized that they didn't know anything about icons. They were basically rather secular people who uh, for years had neglected it. And then all of a sudden, when they began to understand icons, they came up with incredible theories that uh, didn't make any sense when you looked at orthodoxy as a whole. And when you looked at iconography and sacral iconography as a whole, uh, the, these theories that, for instance, you probably might have heard of the theory of reverse perspective that icons are supposed to have reverse perspective. Well, it's nonsense. You rarely find an icon with reverse perspective. But these were things which were established early on in the kind of Russian understanding of icons, and it became kind of a watchword among the scholars. And I think that you really have to take a most, more sober look at it. Uh, a lot of people think of icons, they think, oh, there are these like long, graceful, extended figures. And so you have artists uh, like Novoselsky in Poland. Anyways, the idea of making extended figures, long, graceful, thin figures. Well, that appears in a certain time in Russian icons. And it uh, disappears very quickly by the uh, 18th century and certainly by, even by the end of the 17th century. But it kind of codified itself. And so now when people try to make icons, they try to make these really thin, ethereal-looking figures. Our icons, all our figures and our icons in Western Ukraine are short, squat little people. Uh, and, 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 and they're beautiful. So uh, for, I, I'm going to make a slight digression here. I had to buy icons for my daughter's wedding. And by this time, I have a real sense of you know what are what are what what are what are proper icons. So I went to an artist in Ukraine, the only one I know of, who uses traditional Lemko style iconography. 
Let me show you what I bought for my daughter. Can you see it? And you can see uh, it's not ethereal. These are sort of squat little figures. And they're just like our icons of, uh, of, uh, from the Lemco region in, let's say, any time from 1700 to uh, 1850. So, you know, there's a, there are different approaches. And we have, a, we have an impoverished view of Eastern Christian culture when we only look at Andrei Rublev and, uh, you know, the famous icon painters of, 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 of Russia. No, it's a much more diverse uh, and much more interesting culture. It's got an upper class and a lower class. And the Ukrainian culture is a culture which is very, depends where, uh, but let's say in, in uh, Western Ukraine, in the Habsburg monarchy, it started out very poor, literally poor in the sense of, 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 of physical means. Only with the Habsburgs really did they begin to, to develop more money and developed a, a different culture. But uh, that early culture that they, they had was, was absolutely stunning to my, to, my, to my way of thinking. Oh, yeah, I discovered the War of the Crosses. This kind of thing happened in the 1880s in Ukraine, in, uh, in Halicina. I wrote about it in my book, Galician Villagers, that uh, um, some people would put up the cross, and they would put it up, and, and others say, well, this is a Russian cross, and they would cut the bars off. You know, so there were usually the fights were between the peasants and the priests on the one hand and the authorities on the other hand, uh, the authorities being afraid that these were uh, symbols, symbols of, uh, of, of Russia. So I think it's a it's an extremely complex issue um, and one that Ukrainians have been arguing about for uh, over a century. Well, I would say that uh, a very um, inclusive organization is uh, ASEC, A-S-E-C, A-S-E-C, and ASEC, I think, is the Association for the Study of Eastern Christians, and it is very inclusive. I, I for a while, was, was, was on the executive, so, uh, but still dominant within the organization are Russian historians and historians of uh, R Russian culture. I, I think it's time really we have to rethink. Um, we, have to, we have to see that culture has not only national dimensions to it, not only religious dimensions to it, but also kind of class uh, uh, dimensions to it. So you look at the iconography in Galicia. For a long time, it was done by craftsmen. Uh, the local people would um, would hire pe others to paint, and these painters were often, by our standards, very unprofessional. They didn't understand anatomy very well. You can also see that in early Ukrainian Canadian churches, which is another area where I've worked on. Uh, and this kind of professionalism was was absent in, let's say, Galicia. In Kiev, by the 18th century, the iconography, which was now supported by the state, and which had the riches of the, you know, there was the, Mo the Mohila Academy, the Kiev Mohila Academy in Kiev. There were all these uh, really smart people attached to the church. Um, their iconography, I just reviewed a book for East-West uh, Journal of Ukrainian Studies, by Olha Rizhova from Kiev, and she studied every icon uh, on an iconostasis in, that was done in Kiev between like 1794 and 1802. So the whole 18th century. She shows how richly, um, how connected they were with the literature that was being produced in Kiev at that time by people like Ioanniki Galetovsky and a whole bunch of other 
uh, uh, Dmitry Rostovsky, uh, Tuptalo, you know, all these uh, Kiev luminaries, uh, that the iconography was very much connected with their understanding of things, that the iconography also studied the earlier icons of the Kiev Caves Monastery, which was a center of icon banning. In short, you know, these different material conditions produced very different um, sacred cultures. Also, we say that when you look at um, when you look at some of the Western Christ the the westernmost Eastern Christians, like in the Rusin areas, like far to the west of Ukraine, right? Right in the west. You will see things there that are almost stubbornly orthodox. I, uh, um, an ex uh, there's a, just an excellent article. I think I have it right here. Beroksalana Kwasiv, where she shows that in the far reaches of the westernmost parts of where the Orthodox Church and Greek Catholic Church extended, that very ancient Eastern customs or, or Eastern practices and Eastern uh, uh, lore was incorporated into the iconography and into the naming of churches as though it were a bone to stick in the throat of the local Catholic population. Um, that's another thing that makes it very interesting. It adapts certain things from the West, but it won't go too far. Like I was talking about this book. I know we're off my book. We're talking about iconography a little bit here. But this book by Olha Rizhava shows that they were very interested in Western art, that in the Kiev Caves Monastery, they had manuals of, of drawing and painting that came from the West, that they had, um, what else did they have that was very interesting? They had illustrated Bibles where they copied many scenes from. But on an iconostasis, in that Namisni uh, row, that main row, the sovereign row we call it in English, you know, where the where there's a, like the fullest part of the icon where uh, uh, the Savior, the Mother of God, uh, St. Nicholas and John the Baptist and whoever is, uh, is out there. That was conservative. Use more tempera. The predella is where they explored and they would use oils. And they would elaborate scenes based on the writings of the Kievan writers. Highly sophisticated. You know, so... so uh, uh, that interaction between East and West and what people would accept and what they would reject from the West, really, it's, it, it deserves study. You, can, you can't just write a book on this right now because there's not enough preparatory work. This book that we've put out with France, our attempt is to interest people in the Eastern Christians in their westernmost natural home. And the era we're dealing with is the Habsburg era. Ukrainian uh, orthodoxy under Poland was treated like a stepchild in a fairy tale. You know, it was uh, not treated well at all. And uh, uh, churches, big churches and bishoprics were just given out as favors from... Uh, or as investment opportunities to uh, to uh, people of Greek Catholic origin or Orthodox origin, but uh, who are otherwise thoroughly Polonized. It was a church that uh, was, I would say, until about until the, around the Union of Brest, fifteen ninety six. The Orthodox Church was not just poor, but it was a source of exploitation. It was exploited. It was exploited by uh, the upper classes. It was, you know, they collected from the monasteries, stuff like that. Monasteries were very poor. Everything was very poor. Uh, from 1596, when the religious controversy starts and the Orthodox get the support of the, of the uh, Cossacks, 
things begin to change. But in our period, the Habsburg period, uh, Galicia had not been affected by the Cossacks. They didn't have the Cossacks protection. I mean, obviously, they, 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 there was um, understanding of the Cossacks on the part of the Galicians, but the Cossacks didn't actually conquer it. They didn't hold sway there. So, in that region, the Orthodox Church continued very poor. Uh, and they didn't adopt uh, Greek Catholicism, and, and it wasn't even called Greek Catholicism, it was the Uniate Church. They didn't adopt that till about 1700. And then it was still a very poor uh, church. And there were attempts, to, the attempts by visionary bishops to reform it, but under the conditions of old Poland, that was impossible. The Polish uh, Commonwealth was uh, pretty anarchic. Uh, nobles had their private armies. Uh, the state couldn't, the, the central state almost didn't exist. But when it came to the Habsburgs, every Eastern Christian church that came under the Habsburgs was improved by the central regime. Very different than any previous experience that Eastern Christians had had. So I'll give you some some examples. Um, uh, maybe th this will be from the book. I'll say that we have uh, a, an article about educational reform and the reform of monasteries among the Orthodox Serbs who came into the monarchy uh, as a result of the wars with, with the Turks. And yes, just like the Ukrainians in uh, Galicia and Bukovina, there were educational pro and in Transcarpathia, there were educational programs. All of a sudden, the clergy got better educated. All of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, uh, they invested in uh, in um, well, not not only education, but in making a more reasonable monastic system, because the monastic system in the Orthodox churches had, had declined very much. And uh, although the, 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 this is a, a thing that happened throughout the 18th century, which is that monarchs would reform the, 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 the monastic orders by closing monasteries and things like that. In the Ukrainian case, I think it really improved things, really improved things. And this was true elsewhere. So uh, the, the central powers of the Habsburgs, for one thing, they, when they educated our clergy, which was the first time that had happened, you know, people would, the, before the Habsburgs, Ukrainian clergy usually went to like a summer camp and were ordained, and that was all their training. They might have grown up with their father and learned how to do the services and stuff, uh, but they, there wasn't much theological knowledge or anything like that. I mean, it gives a kind of very earthy feel to our church at that time. But the Habsburgs educated the clergy. The clergy became the army of national awakeners who, who, uh, who, who uh, codified the language and began studying the folklore, and their children became the secular intelligentsia. You know, it's tremendous social elevation of an entire nation uh, because of the care which the Habsburgs put into the development of the church. You have to be thinking of these things as natural rather than exceptional. They have to be the center of your attention rather than something on the periphery. You have to be thinking of these things. And like we're, we're, in, we're in the diaspora and in Ukrainian studies, we're fairly educated people. There's no reason we shouldn't be turning to these very interesting questions. And I'm, Part of this is I'd like to see young people get into it. I'm 72 years old. I, this, I, I talked about Olharej of this book about Kiev in the 18th century. She said she has extra copies of her book she'd like to send to people. So I tried to figure out what scholars could possibly be interested in it. I got, I got maybe four, I think. And it might be that the average age of these scholars is close to 80. You know, and 
you've got to get out of the box. You've got to crawl out of the box and just see how interesting all this stuff is. So maybe let me just talk about the book a little bit more because that I, I think shows sh shows shows what kind of things are possible. So uh, the book opens up with a short introduction by Franz and myself. But then we have a long, uh, detailed, comprehensive survey of all the Eastern Christians who were in the Habsburg monarchy and the major developments in their history. And that's written by Professor Paul R. Magritte. And he's, you know, he, he's a really good at this. He's one of the best people for compiling a survey, putting out an atlas, a reference book. You know, uh, we, we're very lucky he agreed to write the introduction to this, uh, not, not introduction, it's the first part of the book. He writes his magisterial survey. Then we have uh, three, three articles on the Serbian and Romanian Eastern Christians, both of which have Vidhuk irrelevance, kind of echoes in Ukrainian history, because two of the essays are on Orthodox Uniate polemics, and the other is about the education and reform of monasteries. So, you know, we can realize that, that, the, that the Ukrainian history comes within a context of these kind of same problems being, uh, being um, engaged with by other nations and other uh, churches. And you'll see that there are interesting uh, differences and similarities. But then we then almost all the rest no all the rest of the articles concern Ukrainian uh, history. So uh, we have a guy Joel Brady, who wrote on uh, conversions to Orthodoxy in uh, North America and uh, the homeland. It's called transnational history. So he shows how conversions to Orthodoxy in the new country when you come to America or Canada, uh, fed back into Ukraine and led to new conversions of orthodoxy there. And this kind of dynamic that occurs uh, of people leaving the Greek Catholic Church to join the Orthodox Church. Very interesting. Uh, there is no comparable study. Even on the conversions to orthodoxy, you could only find really one author who was dealing with conversions to orthodoxy within Galicia, and you're looking at him right now. You know, I was the one who started writing about conversions to orthodoxy within Galicia, which is, which is an interesting topic in itself. I wrote a book in which that's a central thing, but also an article that's just focused on orthodox propaganda in Galicia. Then this is followed by five articles on culture. Um, so the first one is by um, Bernadette Pushkash, and she runs the uh, Museum of Greek Catholic Culture in Hungary. Uh, her father was a Greek Catholic priest, and um, she, um, she wrote about the sacred culture of a single eparchy, the Mukachevo eparchy. And in this, she looks at not just iconography, but church architecture, church furnishings, vessels, the sort of total set of what you need for a church, and compares it throughout the region, throughout that one eparchy. And this, by the way, is now, I would say, the gold standard of really good um, uh, studies of this sacred culture, of which there are so few. But the gold standard, I would say, is doing a single eparchy because, and I discovered that in Canada too, you could walk into a Ukrainian Catholic church in Saskatchewan, you wouldn't have to know uh, that you were in Saskatchewan, you could look at the walls of the church and you could say, oh yeah, we're in Saskatchewan, because there are differences by eparchy, by diocese. So she wrote this, uh, where, and she is, she is a, a great expert on, uh, on uh, the iconography and sacred culture of that whole Transcarpathian Preshov region. And that's followed by a, an article by uh, Roxolana Kosium, 
one of the outstanding art historians in Lviv. She works at the National Museum. She's written books on a whole series of topics, and she writes about banners. Banners and their connection to the Habsburg monarchy. Banners, you know, in church we have banners. Horukhve um, in Ukrainian. Uh, we have we have these banners, and uh, uh, she's done a whole big book, richly illustrated in Ukrainian. This is kind of a amuse bush for this kind of study. She writes an article about, uh, which gives you a general picture of the history of banner painting in Ukraine, and but also shows its connections with the Habsburg monarchy. For example, um, you, you would have a uh, uh, Habsburg emblem sewn onto a banner, something like that. Then we follow that by an article by Andriy Zayarnuk, who is a professor at the University of Winnipeg, and who has just finished a wonderful, has just published recently a wonderful book on the Lviv train station. In his course of studying for the Lviv train station, he learned a, a tremendous amount of about the architecture of his native city, which is Lviv. He shows that like in the late 19th century, when they were trying to develop a Galician style in architecture, how much of it uh, they went back to aspects of sacred culture and how churches were redesigned, uh, cupolas added or spires added. And he goes through the kind of debates and um, ab ab about you know, what should be included in a Galician style. And he shows uh, how that actually is realized within various important architectural monuments in Lviv. So you read something like that, you get a different, you know, I go to Lviv all the time, or I did before the COVID uh, crisis. And, you know, I read this article by him and I, and I realize, no, no, I don't know Lviv. I, I sort of think I know Lviv. That's followed by a, a very important article by uh, Olesya Semchishin Husner. She also works at the National uh, Museum, the Sheptitsky National Museum in Lviv. And what's really good about it, she talks about the revival, oh, revival, it's, the revival has to be in quotes, of the Ukrainian national style in iconography. And she focuses on the key figure in this process, Modest uh, Sosenko. Uh, Sosenko was a turn of the century artist who had a uh, Study, who had worked with uh, in Sheptitsky's um, uh, museum and had uh, worked on on the old manuscripts and old books and old icons in the museum, and then painted um, painted in a style that I think well everybody knows combined the kind of or ornamentation and many of the practices of the older Ukrainian art, but now connected to that world of, you know, Art Nouveau, Art Deco. Uh, uh, most of the, you know, you can see examples of this in the works of Butzmanyuk and, and many others, the sort of revival style of Ukrainian national style. He was the guy who did it and she shows his whole career. I just want to say about Modest Sosenko, you may, have heard of him because recently um, the pastor and parish in uh, Slavska destroyed his uh, murals in the church. And it was a huge scandal, huge scandal. And it points to the need that we really have to understand our own culture if we're not going to just destroy it like, like barbarians. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and uh, I think there's only one more left. And that's by uh, Natalia Dmitrishin. And Natalia Dmitrishin wrote about uh, sacred needlework, that is, religious embroidering of 
uh, vestments, of uh, coverings for the chalice. Uh, and, you know, this is work that's on the edge of, yeah, culture and gender studies. Uh, really an eye opener. So I think, you know, people who are, who want to really understand Ukrainian culture, not in a primitive way. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with, with, with all our popular Ukrainian culture. But the thing is, it's also very deep. And I would recommend uh, reading some of these articles and maybe somebody will also develop an interest and we can develop this field and we can begin to know ourselves better. The Greeks used to say, not to sell ton, know, your, know thyself. And I figure we can only know ourselves if we go and look at, at ourselves at different angles. I would like it to be a sort of a prolegomenon or a preface to uh, somebody else's getting turned on to it. That's why I've asked you to, or, or why we've decided to interview is because, you know, in the past I've always written books and I, and I wait and I say, well, let's see what the world says. And the world is very slow on the uptake. So what I have to do now is try to explain why, why we do these things and, and uh, you know, how rich we can become if we just open our treasure trove. Yeah, so I would say this is a, a preface to what I hope is work that more people get into. While I was working on my um, study of the Last Judgment iconography in the Carpathians, um, I met and, and worked closely with so many wonderful people who worked in art history in Ukraine and in Slovakia and elsewhere in Poland, but who were working on our topics. These people were so good to me and they taught me so much that I said, I made a vow to myself that I would do what I could to promote their work. And this book really comes from that. And some of the scholars there are precisely those who helped me so much back in the day when I was working.